what is the church? The church is the people of God, powered by the Spirit of God, guided by the Word of God, working for the glory of God. This is the church. The church is not just a place. The church is the people. The church is not just a monument. It's a movement. The church is not just a building. It's a body. The church is not just an accessory. It's a necessity. This is the church. The Bible says the church is the hope of the world, the salt of the earth, and the city on a hill. The church is the family of God, the body of Christ, and light in the darkness. The church is God's plan A, and there is no plan B. The church is where all kinds of people, from all kinds of places, come together to forsake their sins and to worship their Savior. Where chains are broken and broken hearts are put back together, where prodigals come home and captives are set free, this is the church. Where blind eyes are opened and good news is preached, where the low are lifted up and the proud are brought low, where the lost are found and the helpless find help, where brothers and sisters can find love and acceptance from each other and from their Father in heaven, this is the church. Where the disciples of Jesus are built up in their most holy faith. The church is where the gospel is. The church is where grace is. The church is where God is. The church is you. The church is me. The church is all of us. This is the church. Welcome again to Hope Church. We're excited each one of you can be here to worship Jesus with us on this very cold morning. Uh, it has been very, very cold the last few days and there's been sickness running around and all kinds of things. So uh, when I say I'm glad to see each of you here, I actually really mean that. All right. It's good that you're here and good that we're healthy or at least getting there. Uh, last week was rough on myself and my family is still dealing with it. Um, so it's Jillian and I here today. Uh, that, that's all that could actually make it. But anyway, um, with all that being said and looking at where we are now, uh, we're going through a series called Hope Church Family. And, um, you know, we're talking about the church in and of itself. The church is an amazing living organism. It is God's design uh, and it belongs to Jesus. It doesn't belong to any one of us. Um, it's not about how many physical buildings, but about how many people, individual people make up the body. And we understand the body of Christ to be that which spans all denominations uh, across this country and around the world is what we refer to as the universal church. Um, but in amongst our local assembly, which we call a local church, we have Hope Church and RV. And if you have the app and you go on there and you can see uh, all the other churches that make up Hope Church, we have a bunch more. Uh, but we ourselves are one church right here in Giles County, the New River Valley. And so we believe that the local church is the means by which God is accomplishing His purposes in the world. Followers of Jesus are participants in God's redemptive purposes uh, for the world through the church. Now, membership is meaningful. We call it covenant partnership here at, at Hope Church. And, and we're actually going to have a class next week, if you've never been to the family room before, which we refer to as the family room. And that is we invite you into our living room, although it's the cafeteria. And uh, in there, we, we talk about more of who we are as a church. And we invite you to come. We'll eat. We'll, we'll have discussions on what we believe and what we're doing and where we're going and all that kind of stuff. But it's the last couple pages there, excuse me, in that document, the last few pages is where uh, we have a few things that we covenant together as part of Hope Church. That's why we call it Covenant Partnership. And those things are what we're going through in this series. And so as a family, we agreed together to do these things. So the first one was two weeks ago to protect the unity. Very, very important because as churches grow older and people grow meaner, um, and problems happen, what ends up happening is all kinds of problems and unity just goes out the window. 
Okay, I've seen it in every single church I've ever been a part of. Uh, we, we, we'll see pieces of it here, but my goal is that we create a brand new culture by which when it starts, we just stop it. And we get rid of it by having unity amongst the body. So that, in, that was along the lines of loving one another and, and the phrase, don't gossip. Yeah, that actually means something. All right, if you're going to gossip, hearing it from me, gossip about somebody not affiliated with our church, okay? There you go. Does that make you feel better? No, it shouldn't. All right, here's the bottom line. Just don't gossip anyway. And when it comes to people in our body, love. And when you choose to love rather than gossip, you're going to find that it's going to create unity unlike anything else. Um, we also talked last week about sharing the responsibility um, and talking specifically in a lot of ways about prayer and how we pray for one another, pray for our ministry, we pray for growth. And that was sort of the, the overall and overarching point. Today, uh, I've entitled this, Serve the Ministry. Okay, Serve the Ministry. And so, we're going to take a look at a few things today, really just two points, two major points. And do um, so you think that'll be quicker? Well, I feel better than I did last week, so it'll probably be maybe a few minutes longer than last week, but it'll be all right. You guys will hang on. All right, so uh, number one, how are we going to serve the ministry? Number one is to discover your gifts and your talents. Discover gifts and talents. How many of you have heard a sermon before on your spiritual gifts? Okay, all over the room. You've probably heard it before. Some of you may be saying, what in the world is that? Okay, so we're going to try to cover that without boring the ones who've, quote, heard it before. Um, but I want to look at a passage. You can go to multiple passages in this. You go to Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, and Romans 12. But I want to kind of stick really at this moment just with Romans 12 and look at what it has to say. So if you want to, you can look up those other passages later. But we're talking about discovering your gifts and talents so that you can appropriately serve the ministry. Now, verse 3, this is in Romans chapter 12, and I'm, I'm jumping down to verse 3. It says this, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one of another. So if I stop there and just kind of look at this of what's being said, it obviously says to not think so highly about yourself. We've talked about this before, to be humble, to have humility, to put other people above yourself. We'll even reference a verse that, uh, that Paul's speaking of in reference to Jesus and, and him as the perfect example later. But the idea here is to put yourself below somebody else with the idea that you would be serving that person. And the imagery that's given here is that we are one body with many members, but we don't have the same function. Now, there are some in a group this large, there's going to be some that share the same gift. Well, good, because we need more people, so the same person's not doing the same thing all the time, right? Uh, so that's just the way that it rolls. But truth is, we all really have a different function. There is not one person in this room that makes up part of Hope Church NRV. There's not one that is the same as another. You're going to have similar gifts. You might have one that's a lot like someone else. But you have been made by God very specifically independent and different from everybody else. Now, do you see the point of having you here? You're important. You matter. What you bring to the table for God's glory, not for this local assembly per se, although it is also for this local assembly, but what you bring for this community is something that only you can bring. You say, well, I don't know what that is. Well, good, because we're hoping to kind of cover some of that and give you tools and things that you can utilize later so you can know exactly where you fit in. But it gives this imagery of one body having multiple members. And you've heard all kinds of people say, you know, well, that means that some people are the feet and some people are the toes and some people are the jam in between those toes. Could be. Some people are the hands or the head and others are going to be the arms and the leg. Hey, somebody's got to be the butt, right? <laughs> Somebody asked me, but you know the butt has a lot of important things. If your butt's hurting, you can't sit down. You know, you can't get up. You can't use other leg muscles. Butt's important, just saying, all right? Um, the nose, the eyes, the mouth, the ears, and we could go on. You can, you know, eyebrows, you know, whatever, whatever it is. The idea that the imagery of the body just sets in, in motion this idea that there's so much more at stake. And so you may think, well, I'm nothing but just a pinky finger. That's all that I am. But do without that for a while and see how well you do at grabbing things. 
Okay? See how well you do it? I'm plugging your ear full of earwax. I'm being sarcastic, okay? Whatever it is, you know, in your life, if you don't have a big toe, you don't walk or run very well. It's important to have. If you don't have a leg, you're hopping on one. That just described most churches, by the way, okay? <laughs> hopping around because they don't have two legs to walk on. And mainly because people aren't serving. Maybe they don't know their spiritual gift. Maybe they don't want to serve. Maybe, maybe, there could be lots of things that play a part into why that is that way. But if you go to the, to the standard church in America, at least, you'll find the same thing that every pastor will complain about if you get them alone in a circle with other pastors. And as 10% of the be- people are doing 90% of the work. You ever heard it before? Yeah, I've heard it a thousand times, okay? And it's so discouraging to hear so many people say it. And I'm here to tell you right now that aside from Hope Church, I've never been part of a church that's any different. They're all like that, seems like. Now, I'm not saying that every church is that way and that we are better, but I am telling you this, that we are trying to create a culture here per this message and other things that we talk about with you, that it's not that way. Then right now, I could tell you of all the people that are serving within our ministry, it probably is more like 45 to 50 percent of people are involved in this ministry. And guys, I think that's fantastic. I applaud you, and I'm just so thankful that to be part of this kind of a body. But that means that half of our body is functioning and half of it is not still. It's one thing to be 90, 10, you know, and just to be kind of laying down on the bed because you can't move and only the eyes are moving around or something. You know, that's, that's one thing. Hey, at least we're maybe getting around. But because 100% of our congregation is not involved in some form of ministry, we are not fulfilling what God has called us to do, period. Now, that's not comforting. That's not fun. I don't like saying that. I will say that, again, I think we're in a better place than a lot of ministries I've ever been a part of, and I applaud you for that, and I'm grateful for that. But I hope that after this message today, when you look at what Scripture says to us, that we all find a role somewhere, somehow, functioning exactly as God has told us to do and taught us to do and given us the abilities to do so that we can function properly. Our gifts are to serve with one another, not in spite of of one another. You don't do something because someone else can't. You do something because you've been equipped and you can. It's very easy to point out other people's failures, other people's faults. But when you think of somebody else, I don't want you to think about their failures or their faults. I want you to think about this. Why did God create that person? Yeah, sure, they're not as good as you in whatever it is that is in your mind right now. But God made that person. As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ died for that person. So everybody has a very specific role to play and to serve in the church. Without one piece, we can't stand, we can't sit, we can't laugh, we can't cry, we can't joke, can't even eat because we can't put the food in our mouth. We can't do anything that really matters. Notice the phrase that it says in verse 5, individually members one of another. Because guess what? We share this life together. And by you coming here to worship Jesus, you share one or the most important thing together. And that is the gospel. That is Jesus. You share him. We've got that. No matter where we are, no matter how different we are, if somebody is 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 athletic and somebody has never played a sport in their life, it doesn't matter. We share Jesus. However different you are from somebody else, We share that. We share life in in sickness and in health in lots of different ways. I think about my family this past week, and um, normally, uh, I guess, maybe this is the way, I don't know. I don't get sick often, okay? But I got sick last week. Last Sunday was tough. I'm just here to tell you right now, at at around 9.30, 9.20, when we made it home after youth that evening, um, I literally grabbed a blanket, threw it over top of the clothes that I had on. I didn't care. I had my shoes on. I turned the fire on, I laid on the couch, and I was gone. Okay, that's what happened. I I sweated out that night. I did get a fever that night. Okay, all that happened. That was me. And then I I wonderfully shared that with my family. Isn't that so nice? 
You know, yeah, if we just we just give them, you know, all of this. So my whole family has basically gone through it piece after piece, a couple at a time and here and there. And, and I mean, the thermometer has been going around with us. It's like, hey, you still got a fever? Let's check, you know, let's just see what does it look like? Oh, yep, you still bad. It can't go anywhere. You know, <laughs> excuse me. It's kind of the way it was. We checked Jillian last night. She was good to go. I checked her again this morning. She's still good to go. That's why her and I are here this morning. OK, um, but I make this point that. We share life. Now, that's not one we really want to share with one another. Although, if you work in the nursery or with children at all, teenagers, you're going to end up sharing some sicknesses. It's just kind of what comes along with the game. Um, but we share so much more. We share the good times. You know, can I share with you that last week a teenager uh, accepted Christ as her Savior? Can I share that with you? How awesome is that? You know, that is worth everything. It's why we do what we do. It's, it, it's a great thing. Can I share with you something bad? I don't really want to right now. Uh, but there's all kinds of them. Like, for example, this mo- I'll go ahead and share it. This morning, everything seemed to go wrong. Everything seemed to go wrong. Okay? We, we had a couple people lined up to sing, and they couldn't sing. You know, for various reasons, all legitimate reasons. Um, we had some lined up for instruments, and they couldn't play. Again, all for very legitimate reasons, and it just kind of happened. I left my guitar at home again. Okay, yeah, that happened again. I left my guitar home, called Caleb. Caleb, thank you so much, by the way. And then he can't find a strap, so I'm sitting up here playing like this, okay? Um, and, and that's just the way. Everything, before all that, my iPad fell on the floor because the thing, we, everything went wrong that could possibly go wrong. And then Tim back there made a really good statement. Jay, it's not about you. And he was right, okay? He's right. Why is it? Because it's about all of us. It's about all. We came here. Did you guys not sing? Did you sing? Did you worship while you sang? As bad as it sounded? And you're still shaking your head, yes, thanks, I appreciate that. But anyway, we did it, right? You know, we sang to Jesus, we worshiped him. In spite of all these things, in spite of the bad times, we do this together. We share that because we're a family, all right? And because all this we do together. Again, individually, we're members one of another. And so as we go on, verse 6 and following, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. (coughs) If in prophecy, in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And if you go to some of the other lists, you'll get some other spiritual gifts that are part of that. And, and you know, here you got prophecy, serving, teaching, exhortation, giving, leadership, and mercy. Any one of those strike a bell with you? It may or may not because it's not an exhaustive list. But if any one of those are, hey, I'm okay at that. I can, I can be a good leader. I'm a leader in my workplace. So, you know, I would be a good leader. Then we find a place for you to lead. And we find a place for you to lead with zeal. Okay, that's the idea. If if you're going to contribute, you're going to be one who does it with in generosity and has mercy with cheerfulness and all these things. That again, this isn't an exhaustive list. I did a study some years ago on all of the different um, Greek words that are used. I came up with about somewhere around 20 Greek or different Greek words. There is overlap in that. So, you know, to say, well, there's 14 spiritual gifts. I, I don't know. There's a bunch. There's between 14 and 20 probably. All right. And there's a lot of those spiritual gifts that we can apply to us. And God gave us one. And we'll look at the First Peter 4 passage later. But we'll see that. My initial question to you is this. What are you good at? And you're not answering out loud. You're thinking of this in your own mind. What are you good at? What has God gifted you with? And what ability, what talent has he given you? Where are you supposed to serve? Because a few weeks ago, I asked folks, I said about, um, you know, the, the ministry of, of the Hope Kids. And I said, hey, we're going to try to split classroom. We need some help and, and we need to do this. And, but we don't just want people to fill a class. We want people with the gift of working with the nursery because here's the deal. That's got to be your gift. If you're going to work with little tiny babies for an hour a month, you know, and participate in this, you need to, you need to own this. You need to do it. Don't just do it to fill a spot. And if it's not you, if changing diapers and, and screaming kids are not your thing, do not sign up to work in the nursery. 
That ain't you, okay? No problem with that whatsoever. And there's some, we did a first and second choice amongst the Hope kids and, and looked at it and some said, well, I'm willing to serve here and I'll do that, but I do not want to serve in this one, whatever one it is, you know? And um, I kind of always chuckled because it's like, yep, know your spiritual gift ain't that one. You know, it's easy and it's good because we want to put people where they belong and where they want to serve. Teenagers are awesome. But working with teenagers is tough. All right, you need to be called to teen ministry because they're going to text you at odd times at night. They're going to call you asking for rides. They're, they're going to end up, you know, asking for different things and messaging you. And, and, and then they're going to be super needy. And then at times they're, you're going to wonder that they hate you or whatever's going on. And that like switch flip just like that. What, you know, what's going on there? You know, but teen ministry is awesome, but you got to love it. And if you don't love it, it's not who you are, then it's not your thing. And so you don't do it. And so you find out, what are you good at? What has God gifted you with? Now, I'm talking to new Christians as well. Those of you that are new in the faith that we baptized within the last year or two, and, and you know, you've never really participated in a ministry before, I need you to know that I'm talking to you because as we understand Scripture, the moment of your salvation, God gave you a gift that just hasn't been developed yet. He's given you abilities, you just haven't been doing it yet. And so I want you to know that you don't have to know the Bible in and out. You don't have to know all these theologies in order to serve. Do you know how you were saved? Jesus came, died for your sins, and rose again. And by believing in Him, you have everlasting life. You know the gospel, right? So if you know the gospel, then guess what you can do? At the very least, you can share that gospel. Above and beyond that even, there's lots of other ways that you can serve in a ministry. For the old Christian, I look at you and I say, if you're sitting in your seat right now and you've known better for a long time, can I just say clearly, or maybe ask it this way, did your service run out? Did you complete all the work God had called you to do? Because I haven't yet. I hadn't figured that one out yet. You know, we're all called to serve. We're all called to do something. You're not too old. You're not too busy to serve God. I don't know what you might be. That's between you and the Lord. But you need to fix it now. This congregation, this church, should have every one of its members involved in some ministry, in some capacity. Every last one. So we're to discover what we're supposed to do. Uh, there are lots of different ways you can do that. There are online spiritual gift inventory tests. Did you even know that? It's a thing, okay? There's quite a few of them. So much so that I hesitate even saying one anymore because there's, there's bunches of them. Just type it in, spiritual gift inventory tests. Enter. Check out what it comes up with. Try it out. You know, send yourself an email and get your top three choices of that which you are. You can actually do that, all right? And I'll be honest with you, they're not that far off. They're kind of, they're pretty good, a lot of them, because they're asking basic questions. Do you like this or would you be okay in this situation? It is super simple stuff, okay? And you find out what it is uh, that you like. There, there's other things you could try. You could try doing something and see if it works. Well, think about that. That's a novel idea. Let's just try this ministry. Let's give it a shot. I like so-and-so who's in that ministry. I could join up with them. And, you know, and then you come up here and you sing, and we, say, we all say, no, not again, not happening. You can't sing, okay? Because that's what will likely happen. Uh, but I'm being sarcastic. You know, whatever, whatever ministry you think you'd be good at, start there. Get involved, hop in, try it out. Worst case scenario, it's not for you. Do you know what you do? You back out. Well, that was easy. Now you know. That one didn't work. Let's try another one. That's the attitude. That's where we should be. And there's all kinds of ways to connect in. We mentioned a lot of the teams on Sunday morning, our, our media technology team. If you've got an ear for uh, hearing things and can hear frequencies and stuff like that, I, I encourage you to talk with Rob back there. He'd love to have another person on his team that he could rotate in once a month or something like that to get involved. Uh, there's various people doing all kinds of ministries and serving, uh, cleaning things and setting up our coffee and tearing down stuff. All the, there's so many things to do. But that's just what's on Sunday morning, okay? Let alone throughout the week, let alone working, in, whether it's a small group and you're going to host a home or you're going to be a, a leader in a small group, a facilitator of one in some way. Uh, you're going to get involved in a ministry that we do once a year. It's only once a year, but it's your thing. And it's what you love. And it's something that you're passionate about. And so we give you responsibilities on how you can be part 
of that. We want to be the hands and feet of Jesus in giving out the gospel and living it out in our lives. So that takes us to Ephesians. And it says in chapter 4, verse 11, it says, And He gave the apostles, the prophets, the, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. The exact same imagery He's using here. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So, He's calling us to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. Now, he doesn't just say that to a group of pastors all right, or elders. He doesn't just go to them and say, hey, this is your job to equip the saints. He actually says it to all of us. You realize that it's our job to equip all of us saints. You ever think about it quite like that? You know, so not only do you get involved, but then you find someone else and you help them to get involved in some form of ministry and serving, giving the gospel, etc., etc., to build up the body of Christ and so that we can have unity, deeper faith, and be more like Jesus. It's just a win-win. It sounds awesome. Okay, It is a novel idea and one of the most simplest ideas that we may ever come across, and yet one of the ones least done in the church today. And so we have to fix it. Number two, we want to be able to develop a servant's heart. Develop a servant's heart. Now, I am going to go to that First Peter passage. I think it's a good transition here. And it says in 1 Peter 4, verse 8, Above all, keeping love, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. If we were going through this whole passage, really take some time to talk about, uh, again, letting love cover a multitude of sins, loving one another. Um, such an important concept there. Um, and he says to show hospitality without grumbling. We kind of hit on that last week in one of the things that we talked about. Um, but each one has received a gift, it says in verse 10. So use it to serve one another. These gifts aren't for your glory. Uh, they're, they're not for you per se, but they are for you to use and they're for you to serve and to serve with. All right, if I could think right now, um, when, when you get in my family, when you get above, you know, five or six, you get, so we have six in our family right now. Um, no more is coming. I'm making that clear, okay? But we, we've got six, Okay. Having a car or finding a car that seats six is kind of difficult. Now, they're, now two of them are teenagers, so they want to have friends. And it's like, all right, well, we can only take one more legally. I'll leave it there, okay? We can only do that legally. You know, that's kind of where we are. But let's just say somebody right now came to the Smith family and offered the Smith family a GMC Yukon, which I'd like. You know, I know my wife does. She always looks around. She likes the Yukons and stuff like that. I'm not suggesting someone get us a Yukon. I'm making a point. All right, here's the idea. If somebody bought our family a Yukon and then something happened to the van and all we got is my, my car, which can only seat five people, and I'm making two trips to Walmart and parking the Yukon in the driveway, does anybody see a problem there? Who here in their right mind would leave the Yukon parked in the driveway and make two trips to Walmart from where I live in Wolf Creek with a family of six. Who would do that in the right mind? Yeah, we do it with the church all the time. God gives us a gift and we just kind of set it aside and don't touch it, don't use it. And it can be used for God's glory and so many great things can happen. But it's just like someone gives us something amazing and we just let it sit there for year, year in, year out, and don't ever use it. Your gift is meant to be used, and it's meant to serve others. Now, Jesus displayed this. He displayed it with the washing of the disciples' feet. He displayed it with messages that he taught. He, you know, when he washed the disciples' feet, he washed Judas's feet, okay? So he served other people, not just people that were friendly to him, people that would betray him and have him to lose his life over that friendship, okay? So he, he was certainly... 
serving other people. He was the example that was given in, in Philippians. And, and I'll just read these two verses um, where it says this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. And then it talks about having this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And goes on to show how he gave his life for all of us. So he was certainly the example. God himself died for creation so that you and I could have everlasting life. Now he taught this, and I want to take a look at these verses. I'm going to do this kind of quickly, but in Matthew chapter 23, it says this, Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do, uh, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works that they do. For they preach, but they do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear. They lay them on people's shoulders. They themselves are, un are unwilling to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad, the things that hung off their uh, clothes and such. Um, they make those phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at the feasts and the best seats in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who's in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus was teaching here to serve. He was teaching that these scribes and Pharisees, they all wanted position. They wanted power. They wanted titles. They wanted respect. They wanted to be noticed. All right? All of these things you know, that they were looking for and looking after, but were looking for all the wrong things. You know, I remember when I was around uh, probably 14 years old, I might have been 15, and um, I remember specifically, I'll never forget this, but I would ride my bike, I would take my bike from my house, and I would ride seven miles to my grandma's house. And when I got there, I would help grandma and grandpa out, and I, my grandfather had died at the time, so I would go to her house and I would mow her grass, Okay. Then I'd take my bike, hop back on it, and I used her machine, you know. I'd hop back on my bike, and I'd go to my great-aunt Jenny's. It's another seven miles. It was, a, it was a big triangle, you know. And I went another seven miles up there, and then I'd mow her grass. And, of course, if, if I brought my BB gun, I'd get to shoot a couple of chipmunks or something like that. So that was always a little fun and everything. And then I'd make it from there and go seven miles more back to my house to where then I would mow my grass. And that was a Saturday as, as a young teenager, okay? Um, and as I was doing that, I remember, remember just mowing that grass and thinking to myself, man, if so-and-so could see how good of a job I'm doing right now, you know? If somebody could see the lines that I'm keeping, the way that I'm blowing these, these leaves away from the house, and just everything is so, as a teenager, I was so good at what I was doing, right? I, I wanted everybody to see that. And I, I would think to myself, if my girlfriend could see this, you know, she'd think I was hot, you know, I was really cool, you know, I'm being sarcastic. Um, but I'm trying to make this point that in life we do that. I've caught myself many, many times thinking, wondering, you know, even while doing something really good for somebody else, I wonder, I wonder if anybody would see, see that I'm doing this, you know, because what's the point if nobody really sees it? And now we're already in the wrong place, aren't we? Okay? Because there's a big point. Jesus is saying, you're not doing it to be seen. Nobody needs to watch you do something good for somebody else. You're just to serve one another, help one another, be there for one another. And we here at Hope Church need to create a culture of serving without being noticed. You don't do it for accolades. You don't do it for someone to say thank you, although it's always good when someone does, right? It's always good when you get noticed. If somebody notices you, I'm not telling you to not enjoy that. There's nothing wrong with that. But we need to make sure that our motives are correct in everything that we do, that we're not like these scribes and Pharisees. Because all they want to do is be seen by everybody. And Jesus says, go ahead and listen to them. Their teaching's fine, but don't dare act like them. Because they're horrible inside and out. Like whitewashed tombs, like graves is what he was referring to when he says that. So we're going to create a culture of serving without being noticed. If you want to be the greatest, 
Okay, that's your desire, which by the way is kind of a human desire. We want to be great at whatever we do, right? If you want to be the greatest, then be the best at being the least. Serve people. I'm going to repeat that. If you want to be the greatest, then be the best at being the least and serve somebody else. And according to Jesus, who is really all that matters that you're seen by, you're the greatest at that point. Serve someone else. Jesus continues the teaching by saying in Mark 9, 35, that if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Who are you serving? Your spouse? In what way? Between you and you and her, you and you and him, think about it. How are you serving your children? Shouldn't it be the other way around? No, 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 hold on. I said it correctly first. How are you serving your children? All right, children, teens, how are you serving your parents? How are you serving those that are leading you? How are you serving your teachers? How are you serving your boss, your friend? How about this? Your enemy. Because Jesus has called us to do that. We have to develop a servant's heart. And we also have to discover our gifts and talents so that we can serve the ministry properly so that Jesus gets all the glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for another day and thank you for allowing us the opportunity to come and to be here. We thank you for being an awesome God who loves us and cares for us. Lord, you you gave gave your life for us. And we just pray that you would work in a way that only you can. Lead us and guide us. Help us discover our spiritual gifts to have good conversations that will lead people in that way. And we just pray that in all things, you would get the glory. As more people in Hope Church serve and find out where it is that they belong, we're going to see a body that does amazing things. And so we give you the glory for that, and we ask you to work in Jesus' name. Amen. All my words fall short I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often But every song must stay.